Thanks to the light of the invitation uh, for the, this lecture today. I'm very grateful to that. So, ha as you may know, uh, recently, uh, with a joint effort uh, with the GIGA Council, so uh, Agnes Noel, uh, Marianne Filet, and, and myself, uh, we applied for a project uh, to, to, to get funded to uh, acquire a new mass spectrometer. And we get that done, so we have now 1 million euros to invest in the single cell proteomic. Uh, analysis, and hopefully in some months we will be able to propose such analysis to the scientific community of UBH. So, uh, just a few words about uh, Nikolai. Uh, Nikolai received his <coughs> Bachelor of MIT in 2004, and then pursued doctoral research in the Bergstein Laboratory at Princeton University, aiming to understand how cells coordinate their growth through gene expression and metabolism. As a postdoc in uh, the Van Oudenaarden laboratory at MIT, characterized traders of Arabic glycolysis, also known as one book effect, and obtained direct evidence for differential stoichiometry among core ribosomal proteins, suggesting that specialized ribosomes regulate protein synthesis. So recently, uh, Nikolai created his own lab in the Northeastern University. He is now a scientific leader in that field. Uh, single cell analysis. It's really a pleasure to welcome him today to give this lecture. So I will invite him to come on stage. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for the kind introduction. I would like to invite all of you to interrupt me with questions. We don't have to wait until the end. I love having interact interactive discussions with colleagues. So and they are aware that especially the technology that they'll be talking about might be unfamiliar for you. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. So we will be talking about analyzing single cells. And I want to start with the question as to why should we do that? And one obvious reason is that the cells that make up our body are quite distinct, as you can see here, from a tumor cell surrounded by some T lymphocytes. But this kind of diversity, presumably one could analyze by isolating the T cells from the tumor cells in bulk and then analyzing groups of T lymphocytes and group of tumor cells. Uh, there are also other differences between cells, functional and molecular differences, that are less conspicuous. Sometimes even cells that look very similar to each other can differ functionally and molecularly. And I'll give you a couple of examples of such differences. One is the emergence of priming for drug resistance. Uh, they're melanoma cells that are much more likely to become drug resistant but they look the same as those that are not primed for drug resistance. So we cannot easily look under the, mi the microscope and say, these cells are going to survive the drug treatment and those are not going to survive. Similarly, macrophages are innate immune cells that play diverse and important roles in our tissues. And they, they can have very different functions. They can be the pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory functions. And again, those differences are not so easily seen there within a cell type. Similarly, with T cell exhaustion and cellular senescence, these are all areas that we study in my lab. We have variability of function and molecular composition within a cell type. Uh, and then as we talk about single cell analysis, of course, we have to acknowledge that the most widely used technology around the world is single cell RNA sequencing. So why do we need to measure proteins in addition to measuring RNAs? And here I want to give one example with the protein P53. Uh, and the transcript for that protein has been measured here with two different methods, qPCR and RNA sequencing, that mostly agree. And the protein abundance is also measured with two different methods that mostly agree. But as you can see, the transcript abundance of P53 tells you virtually nothing about the protein abundance of P53. And of course, in this case, we understand this is because P53 is regulated primarily by protein degradation. And then we did single cell analysis a couple of years ago of macrophage polarization. In that example, again, we saw that the levels of P53 measured at the transcript level 
were not associated with the protein levels. And what was interesting is that the protein level of P53 was quite predictive in single cells for its transcriptional activity, while the RNA level was not predictive for the transcriptional activity. And then another motivation for my group to measure proteins in single cells is the possibility to infer regulatory models from the variation among single cells. And in particular, if we look at the activities of two proteins, they could be two protein kinases that regulate each other. We can see whether there is a correlated joint distribution or not correlated joint distribution. But correlation doesn't really tell you if there's cause or regulation. They could be indirectly associated. So by having a lot of single cell measurements, we can condition on potential confounders, as, I, as I've indicated here. And we can use this kind of approach to distinguish between different classes of regulatory models in assumption-free way. And that's something that we're quite interested in doing. Uh, and today I'll share with you some early examples of studying protein co-variation and, and being able to biologically interpret that. Uh, and first, before I talk about the biology, I'll give you a very short introduction to the technology. How do we actually measure proteins in single mammalian cells? The first thing is to do sample preparation um, and do it in a way that we don't lose the proteins from tiny single cells and we don't introduce a lot of contaminants. My laboratory has developed uh, three generations of methods for doing this approach, all the way from simpler methods where we used to sort single cells into multi-well plates and do sample preparation, which is somewhat similar to uh, to that for SmartSeq 2 or 3, if you're familiar with that. Uh, but the, the technology that they want to tell you about is doing the sample prep in these droplets. They're sorted, they're deposited on a completely flat surface of a microscopic glass slide. And we can deposit, uh, we can deposit them in any arrangement we want. We just program a computer and tell the computer to deposit in those coordinates and the computer does that. And then we can put uh, many thousands of these droplets on the glass slides. And each droplet is going to receive a single cell. The cell will be lysed and the proteins will be digested. Then if desired, as in my laboratory usually is desired, we like doing multiplex analysis, the peptides from each single cell can be labeled with mustads. And then inside of this microfluidic manipulation device, device the cells are pulled together and samples transferred into a multi-well plate, a 3D4 multi-well plate that then is placed into an autosampler and analyzed by mass spectrometry. And this workflow is highly automated at this point. Um, I'll share with you some representative uh, statistics. One is, one question that you might have is, okay, you did all that, but how efficiently could you extract proteins from single cells to send them to the mass spec analysis? And we have done benchmarking experiments to compare efficiency of extraction from a single cell relative to efficiency of extraction with a standard protocol of uh, tens of thousands of, of cells. And we find that we have 95% efficiency relative to the optimized bulk approach. And then another question might be, okay, so you get signal, you identify and quantify many proteins, but how clean is that signal? How much of what you measure is just background of ions throughout the air? And for those of you who don't do mass spectrometry, one of the amazing things to share is that the air that we breathe is full of ions. Those of you who do mass spec can see that all sorts of ions, we don't even know all of them. So a, a good way to, to make sure that we get clean signal from the proteins is sometimes intentionally not to put a single cell into the droplet. And then we can ask what kind of signal we get in one of these droplets if we do everything that we do for the single cell, just don't put the single cell. We call these droplets negative control wells. And here you can see the signal from the negative controls. It's none. We don't get any signal. And you can see from the single cells we get uh, uh, quite, quite, quite strong uh, uh, peptide signal, protein signal. Now, this slide is more for the aficionados, those who actually do mass spectrometry. In, if we digest proteins by trypsin, as we usually do, we know that peptides have, peptide ions have plus two, plus three charges. 
while contaminant ions in the air have plus one charges. So we can see how many of the ions that our mass specs detect are peptide-like ions in blue or contaminant ions in red. And uh, you can see that contaminant ions are about 10 times less abundant than the peptide-like ions, which for working with single cells is, uh, is a challenge, a challenge that now we have overcome and we are happy with, with this result. Okay, so we prepared our samples. I showed you some data that sample preparation extract signal doesn't have high background. Let me tell you a little bit about how protein analysis with mass spectrometry works. Uh, just ABC in two minutes. Uh, to do proteomics, we, we usually need to separate the peptides. Uh, and we tend to do the separation with liquid chromatography or capillary electrophoresis. So here on one axis, our data has the separation in time, and on, on the other axis, we measure mass overcharge. So each color here corresponds to um, an ion cluster of a particular peptide sequence. And here, if we zoom into those, you can see the clusters corresponding to different peptides. So if we measure the mass overcharge of a peptide with very high accuracy, this information is not enough to determine the sequence because it can permute the sequence to have the same mass overcharge. Then you have to fragment the peptide. And from the fragments, the fragments are made by peptide breaking in the peptide bonds, so we can determine the sequence. And uh, then one of the challenges is that if we are isolating one peptide at a time, uh, we, we are going to have a limited amount of time to cover the full proteome because it might take a few hundred milliseconds, but that's still time. And in fact, we mass spec instruments are phenomenal like the instrument that uh, you're going to acquire with the new funding. Congratulations on that. Uh, they're, they're very sensitive. And the good news is that we see ions from tens of thousands of distinct peptide sequences. It's quite impressive, over 60,000. But now just seeing the peptide ions is not the same as having determined their sequences. The question is, how do we do that? If, if we're isolating one at a time, we're not going to have enough time for all of them. It's a little bit like you. You're very capable. We can do all sorts of things, but you don't have time for all of the things that you would like to do. So mass specs are faced with that same problem. And because of that, we tend to prefer, we tend to like uh, multiplexing where we can analyze multiple samples at the same time, or even ideally what we really love is analyzing both multiple single cells and multiple peptides. So with new methods that we've developed, and I'll tell you a bit about, we can isolate hundreds of peptides and analyze them at the same time. Uh, so if we're analyzing the one peptide at a time with the older technology, in, in about an hour of time, we can analyze 10,000 peptides, 10,000 peptide ions. And the way mass spectrometry works is that we are going to identify the sequences of about half of them. So what I'm going to tell you about is a simple idea that we implemented to get us much closer to identify the sequences of every single peptide ion that we analyze. That is to move, to push this curved line here closer to the solid line and then to pick the peptides and proteins that we're most interested in. We might quantify only 1,000 or 2,000 proteins, but wouldn't it be useful to quantify the 2,000 proteins that we're most interested in rather than just those who happen to be the most abundant? And to do that, we developed a prioritization workflow using real-time alignment. So the way this works is that uh, we can exactly tell the instrument when to expect a peptide ion of interest to arrive. And we can look at the periodic table of elements and tell exactly what is the mass overcharge of that ion. And then there is still a problem because if we do that, it might turn out that we had such a long wish list of peptides to analyze that so the instrument might not have enough time to analyze everything on that list. So what we introduced is telling the instrument what are our highest priorities and making sure that they get analyzed first and then our medium priority and then finally the lowest priority. So for the experts of you, here these areas correspond to duty cycles to give example of what would happen if we detect lots of peptide-like ions, 
and what the instrument logic is going to choose. In the first cycle, most analyze high priority IS, and then uh, in the second, also having in some time for a low priority IS. How does this work? Does it really improve the data? Uh, so here are some representative statistics of comparing doing this real-time alignment, which is done with software called MaxQuant Live, with and without prioritization. So in red here, you can see that the success rate is substantially increased, meaning we get very high consistency data. All peptides are quantified in all single cells. Uh, when you do the prioritization, and we can achieve this without concomitant reduction in the protein coverage, the protein coverage remains high. And if you look at these data here for the number of detected precursors in their sequence, yeah, you see that the instrument is doing exactly what the prioritization logic would, would suggest. Uh, a, a nice advantage of this approach is that we can also very significantly increase proteome coverage compared to the shotgun method of heuristic selecting just the most abundant peptide. And the reason why we can do that is that now uh, every peptide ion that we choose for analysis for our limited time is identifiable. If we just pick highly abundant ions, some of those might correspond to things that we'll never identify, so modified peptide or trypsin, uh, trypsin byproduct. While in this case, uh, we know that everything that we select to fragment is likely a peptide that we can identify, and that results in us assigning confidence sequences to about 90% of, of uh, peptides and for to analysis and that naturally increases protein coverage considerably between shotgun and prioritized analysis in here. And the other thing that it does is increases sensitivity in the dynamic range. So in blue here, you see the um, distribution for the of abundances of uh, peptides, uh, proteins quantified uh, with shotgun analysis and in the right with prioritization we begin to see many lowly abundant peptides. And as I'm going to show you in a few slides down, the, uh, down my presentation, some of these slowly abundant peptides correspond to post-translational modifications, such as proteolytically cleaved products uh, that now we can deterministically prioritize. Now, the, other, the ultimate approach to multitasking is just do lots of things at the same time. What I told you now was about fragmenting one peptide at a time, but that allows us to fragment the peptides that we're really interested in and quantify, but what about being more ambitious? What about fragmenting everything? And this is what we can do with data-independent acquisition, but the challenge with data-independent acquisition, this is basically isolating large swaths of ions, is that it's usually done in a label-free way, meaning that we analyze only one single cell at a time, and we want to analyze many single cell, uh, cells at a time, and then we wanted to improve the, the coverage of the proteome data interpretation because these spectra become very complex. You can naturally ask me, so why, why would anybody isolate only one peptide at a time to begin with? Well, because the data is simple to interpret. Once you start isolating hundreds and thousands, data become complex and there are challenges with interpretation. So essentially our idea here, the concept that we wanted to test is that we can simultaneously analyze in parallel many peptides and many samples, and this can give us a multiplicative scale. And I'm gonna show you a proof of concept for doing this with um, three labels. And we designed this very rigorous experiment that is widely practiced in the proteomics community for benchmarking relative quantification, which involves mixing the proteomes from different species, from bacteria, from yeast, and human into known ratios. And then we can quantify protein abundances and see if what we quantify, the ratios that we quantify, correspond to the mixing ratios. And we did that with those three samples, and then each sample was analyzed either in a label freeway without labels, or they were labeled with non isobaric mustards. And then upon labeling, they were mixed and analyzed together. So now we are using three times less time. That's, that's the goal here. We want to increase throughput. And the question is, can we still reserve and preserve the quantitative nature of the data and the protein coverage? And the result is first, we get about three times more data points, and we actually quantify a larger number of proteins consistently across all 
three samples, and this is because we get better overlap of the quantified proteins. So in terms of the question of data generation, yes, we generate three times more data. That's working as we expected. And we also have much less missing data than with any other method previously developed. So that's good. But are these data points any good? So let's look at the ratios. Here uh, on the x-axis, we have the abundance of the proteins. So these are complete proteomes that we've mixed. They span the dynamic ranges. And the, dot, the dashed lines correspond to the expected mixing ratios. Uh, and the data points correspond to measured ratios. And here, this is also shown in the box plots. And what we find is that the measured ratios are very close to the expected ratios, affirming that this multiplexing preserves the quantitative nature of the data. There is no downside in terms of accuracy of quantification. And we can also demonstrate that uh, the uh, peptide sequence propagation works very well with something that is a little bit too technical. I'll skip it because I'm eager to focus on the biology. This is how the raw data look like. Uh, maybe I'll just take a few minutes more to tell you about the technology. I'm eager to transfer to, to the biology section, but I don't want to skip this one because I think it's pretty cool. So here you can see the, a particular peptide ion as it eludes from the chromatography. Uh, this is the, the precursor uh, in pancreatic adenocarcinoma cells. And this is another single cell monocyte. And you can see again the same peptide diluting. This is part of the same experiment. And here you can see the fragments of that peptide diluting. So based on the consistency of this data, we can start having a lot of confidence in the raw data and in the accuracy of both identification and quantification. Just as a rough statistic, especially for those familiar with single cell RNA sequencing, uh, each peptide protein in our analysis on average is detected with uh, 30 to 100 copies. And per single cell, we count a few million copies, depending on the instrument and depending on the parameters. So just to show you how you can use this data to derive reliability estimates for a single peptide measured in single cells. So each line here corresponds to a survey scan. That's a measurement in the instrument. So we can get at least three independent measurements from the precursors, and we can get independent measurements from the fragments, and we can ask, are these consistent with each other? And in this case, they're very consistent, and we can have high confidence that the ratio is indeed what we say it is. And if they're not consistent, then it's good to know that we shouldn't trust that particular data point. Um, this is how the data look like now comparing the accuracy for hundreds of proteins quantified either in single cells. These are the relative levels in, in, of sing, of, in single cells on the x-axis, uh, on the, the y-axis and on the x-axis, the same corresponding relative levels in conventional bulk samples. Uh, and one thing to emphasize here is the dynamic range that now we can see with Plex DIA, we have about a thousand fold dynamic range of relative protein changes. And that's something that earlier method could, could not achieve. We, we are quite happy with this. Good. So I hope this technology introduction was reasonably comprehensible, even for those of you who are not much mass spectrometrists. And now I'm going to switch gears and talk about biology and what we can do with this kind of measurements. And first thing, I'll talk about the project with primary macrophages. Macrophages are fascinating cells to study at the single cell level because they're so incredibly diverse in their functional phenotypes. And the system that we used in this study were primary macrophages derived from bone marrow. And they were either untreated or treated with LPS. And if we just project the data on the axis of, of, of a PCA plot, we see that we can easily tell the two subpopulations. And that's not surprising. That's a low bar. We can also convince ourselves that this separation is not driven by some artifact or cell size, because if we project on the same sets of axes of the PCA bulk samples, as shown here with those big squares, we see that they separate in the expected way uh, as the single cells. Now let's look at some functional sets of proteins. What's their abundance? If we look at type 1 interferon signaling, we see that it's uniformly low in the untreated cells, 
more or less uniformly high in the treated cells. That's expected. We treated the cells with an inflammatory agent. They uniformly have had more interferon signaling. We didn't need to do single cell measurement for that. That's a very expected outcome. But now if you look at phagosome maturation, you see a very different picture, where the variability, the heterogeneity, is not between the conditions, but it's within a condition. Both the untreated and the treated cells have some cells that have more phagosome maturation proteins and some that have less. And when we did this experiment, our collaborators at Harvard Medical School said, well, we think that these cells are really not all that different. So we don't know about these protein differences which you measure, but we, we're not sure that they correspond to any functional specialization. So we said, okay, good, let's test that. Let's test whether they're functional differences or not. And the way we tested it is by measuring phagocytic activity in those cells, both the untreated and the treated here, show data only for the um, treated ones. And we saw that there is a 30-fold dynamic range in terms of the phagocytic activity. Uh, and then this uh, difference in uptake activity of uh, labeled dextra was associated with differential protein abundance as much as tenfold and more differential abundance of proteins, including some positive controls here, Manel's receptor, that was an expected protein uh, to be positively associated with, with high uptake of, uh, uptake of dextran. And then we were able to take this, this protein signature and correlate it back to the PCA analysis and demonstrate that the single cell variability that we originally observed with the mass spectrometry measurement, in fact, is associated with those functional differences of uh, dextran uptake uh, activity. And then having identified that indeed there is a molecular and functional differences within these uh, primary macrophages, we wanted to see if we can identify some of the regulatory mechanisms. And we know that one of the modes of regulation of macrophages is based on proteolytic cleavage of proteins. So we developed our prioritized analysis that I told you about. We tuned it in to measure proteolytic products. And we first used classical well-established methods for measuring proteolytic products in bulk to, to validate the ability to measure proteolytic products in single cells, which is what I've shown here on the top. And we demonstrated that those proteolytic products that we measure are associated with the inflammatory status of the cell. And then we were, we were able to measure these proteolytically cleaved peptides in the single cells shown here in the bottom panels. So I'll switch here gear to tell you about the gears to tell you about another biological system to which we applied single cell proteomics, and that was in the context of drug resistance emergence in melanoma cells using recently derived cell lines from, from patients that uh, has been used by Arjun Rajas Labs and other to study the emergence of, of, of drug resistance in these jackpot cells, rare cells that develop drug resistance. Um, so, when we did this analysis, we also analyzed many monocyte cells, but what we found with these melanoma cells is that there are two distinct clusters present in the cells. And when we see distinct clusters, we always worry about artifacts and batch effects contributing to seeing a cluster. Is this biologically meaningful, or is it just something reflecting artifacts as part of, of sample fragment? One way to, to guard against technical artifacts is to see if, does this cluster corresponds to day of sample preparation, label use, digest, or any of that. And we did it, and we did the association. But to really convince ourselves that this separation is real of those clusters, we simply analyzed different biological replicas <coughs> of those cells with two very different mass spectrometry methods. One was this prioritized analysis, and the prioritized analysis here shown is PISCO. This does measurements at MS2 level on the report ions, while the PLEX-DA does measurements at MS1 level on the precursors. And these are two completely different ways of measuring protein abundance that share very few biases in common. So if we can see that those two different methods give very similar results, we can have high level of confidence. And in fact, 
when we compare it even more quantitatively the relative protein levels between this cluster here and this with the two different methods, we saw that they're highly concordant. So uh, that's, that's a particularly nice aspect of single cell mass spectrometry where in addition to being able to derive confidence from individual measurements, you can also apply now two very different types of measurements to have even more confidence in the data. So then we explored a bit more of having identified that these clusters are real. Now we explored in a little bit more details uh, what do they correspond to? What's the underlying biology? And uh, the first thing that we did was to color code each single cell based on the abundance of proteins that uh, were previously identified to be markers for drug resistance. And we find that uh, this larger cluster corresponds to the non prime cells, while the smaller cluster corresponds to cells with uh, express markers primed for, for resistance. And we also find that the smaller cluster tend, tends to correspond to senescent cells that secrete proteins. So these are some of the significant uh, sets of proteins that we identify to be rich in the smaller cluster. And the larger cluster is more associated with proliferative behavior. So indeed, from the single cell measurements, we can also infer the phase of the cell division cycle of each cell. And we can, based on this analysis, we can confirm that uh, the senescent cells, those the cells that are primed for drug resistance, are mostly in G1 phase and they don't divide as actively as uh, non-prime cells. Uh, but we can go one step further having measured all these proteins. Now we can do cooperation analysis. We can find are there some molecular differences in the cell division cycles of the primed and the non primed cells? So for that analysis, we correlated the cell division uh, cycle markers to the proteins, and we identified that there are quite a few protein sets here, for example, uh, MAP uh, cascade and also some immune related proteins such as I kappa B kinase cascade that are differentially associated with different cell division cycle phases uh, between those two different clusters corresponding to the degree of uh, drug resistance primary. And then we observed another curious thing. So as we isolate our single cells for protein analysis, we take pictures of them. And from the pictures, we can estimate the radius and we can see how big those cells are. And there isn't a difference in size between the primed and the non-primed cells, but there's a difference in protein content relative to the size. Meaning that for the same size, somehow the primed cells appear to have less protein. That seems odd, so why can that be? Maybe we did not extract protein as efficiently, but we're quite confident in our extraction of protein. We benchmark that, we use DMSO, which is a very aggressive lysing reagent. So why would that be? Why would there be less protein per cell? So what, what else would be there? And they thought, well, these cells grow slowly, and when I was a PhD student, they actually spent a lot of time analyzing metabolism and its connection to cell growth. They remembered the classical result. Cells that grow slowly tend to accumulate glycogen, and cells in G1 phase accumulate glycogen reserve carbohydrates. So we decided to test this hypothesis, and we looked for differences in the abundance of enzymes participating in carbohydrate metabolism, and consistently we saw that there is less glycolysis in the prime cells, which is consistent with they being less glycolytically active. But then we went one step further and actually measured glycogen directly in those cells, and we found that yes, indeed, uh, these prime cells accumulate glycogen. And I, I show this a bit as, uh, as an aside factoid because it's, uh, it's an interesting example to, to demonstrate what you can gain when your sample preparation is so consistent that you can start trusting differences in the amount of total amount of protein that you measure per single cell. And also the one of the 
big differences between protein and RNA. If we had seen differences in total RNA amount, I would not know what that means or how to interpret it for total molecular composition because only a few percent of the cell mass are RNA. Now, given that the majority of cell mass is protein, difference in total protein amount per cell means something, something quite different. So how about this jackpot co-expression? What has been found previously very interesting with the emergence of, of drug resistance is that there are these rare cells that have much higher abundance of particular transcripts associated with drug resistance so developing. But they're so rare, very, very, very rare, that if you assume that this expression is completely uncorrelated between the marker genes, they would essentially not exist these cells. So what, what uh, previously Arjun Raj and others found is that there is co-expression of the drug resistance markers and we wanted to test to what extent this also happens at, at the protein level uh, and to what extent it happens not only between the primed and non-primed cells but really does it happen within a cluster not just across the clusters, but within. So here you can see an example with one, uh, with the pair of proteins where we plotted their abundances measured um, across all the single cells and we color coded the prime cells here in gray, in dark gray, and the uh, non prime cells in light gray. And you can see that those proteins go very positively together. They're correlated. And what's interesting is that they're correlated within a cluster, not just between the clusters. And this is, an, for example, something that we could never have identified without single cell analysis. If we were to somehow have really good antibodies to sort out the primed and the non-primed cells, then we could see that these proteins are both low in the primed, high in the non-primed, but we couldn't see that they co-vary within the non-primed cluster. And we found this interesting. So we wanted to see if this is more general for other proteins and we did systematic analysis. And here is uh, one of the results of the systematic analysis that we did. And in particular, what we found is that uh, proteins that, that uh, function in glycolysis, like lytic enzymes, show this co-variation quite strongly within a cluster. And the same with oxidative phosphorylation. So that means that within the non-primed cells, within this cluster here, we have this gradient of some cells being more glycolytic and other cells relying more on oxidative phosphorylation. And it's really a continuous gradient that exists before cells become primed for drug resistance. And perhaps that indicates that there is this continuous continuum of cell states uh, uh, indicating that cells are traversing a certain path moving from being non-resistant to, to being more resistant, uh, more primed to develop resistance. Uh, and then we, uh, another way of visualizing this on a more global scale now is to uh, look at the um, abundance uh, to, of all proteins that are differentially abundant between the, non, the non-primed and the primed cells. And here we either color coded each single cell uh, based on these proteins, uh, based on their mean abundance, or on the top we just plotted um, the mean abundance of, of proteins that are enriched in the prime cells or proteins enriched in the non-prime cells. And we see this continuous gradient. What, why, why do we trust that? So sometimes if you see continuous measurement, maybe that's in part due to having noise in the data and that prevents you from seeing things being crisper. But in this case, the reason to trust it that gives me a lot of confidence is the very high degree of, of agreement between the plex DIA and the P-scope measurements. And remember, these measurements are done in different biological replicates using very different mass spectrometry methods that don't share biases in terms of the measurement. So the, the fact that we can see this consistency between different methods and different biological replicates uh, really strongly suggests that this gradient uh, that we see within uh, a state, within a cellular state, is, is real. So if you're interested in playing with the data that they showed, 
or any of the other data sets that my lab has generated that I did not show today, uh, you can go to, to this URL and download any data that you're interested in. And not only the data, you can also download the metadata. And you can download the code that you use to analyze it. And you can download all of the intermediate processing files. And if somehow you want to find something but you don't find it, let me know and we'll share that with you. We are very eager to facilitate um, reproduction of our work and to facilitate uh, the growth of single cell proteomics. That's why I'm, I'm here and I'm excited to hear that uh, this place is going to move towards doing single cell proteomics. We need more centers of excellence that can help realize the potential of the field and uh, delighted to see that happen. Well done. Thank you. Uh, and this is actually a good segue to show you some data from the instrument that you're about to acquire. So here on the top are data from TeamStop SCP system from Brooker. This is a new uh, state of the art <coughs> instrument uh, which we used with Plex DIA. And then on the bottom, you can see the same samples analyzed with a Q-Exactive instrument. It's an Orbitrap instrument, older instrument, quite a bit older. And you can see that the, the new instrument is able to analyze uh, about twice as many peptides and proteins confidently identified using very short gradients. So in this case, because we, because we use the PlexDA labeling multiplexing, we can analyze one cell every five minutes. Uh, but I should also emphasize that this is, it's, it's wonderful that you guys can get team stuff. As it's, it's a very good system. But I should also emphasize that we are delighted by the quantitative data that you get with QXX. While the coverage is lower, the data are highly, highly quantitative. Um, and one particular aspect of the team stuff instrument that we found to be very strong is that the Proteins, proteins are consistently identified across all the single cells, especially within a PLEX DIA set, as shown here with the Jacquard distance. We have 98% overlap, 98% of proteins are in common quantified across all labeled cells. So I shared with you some relatively initial results for the current state of single cell proteomics, but it's a very dynamic field that is poised to develop rapidly and hopefully can contribute to that development. And they're both tremendous opportunities to increase the depth of proteome coverage. We still quantify a relatively small fraction of the peptides, uh, interpret a relatively small fraction of the mass spectra in our data. And we have outlined specific opportunities to increase data interpretation as much as tenfold to increase the depth of protein coverage. And there is also huge opportunity to increase the throughput by multiplicative scaling, by in increasing the plex of DIA, by analyzing in parallel both peptides and, and proteins. And in fact, I was recently approached um, with interest from um, a funding body to start uh, a new research institute in Boston that will develop a technology platform driving single cell proteomics and apply this technology platform to a variety of biomedical problems. Two of our flagship projects are going to be focused on Alzheimer's disease and aging. So, um, we were we are fortunate to be in the final stages of finalizing this agreement. It's for many tens of millions of dollars. We'll have super nice facility, um, and we'll be looking for people, and we'll be paying well. <laughs> so if you're interested, <laughs> not, not to steal from your people, <laughs> but if you're interested, do let us know. Uh, we we hope everything that we develop is going to be widely shared with the community. This is non-profit; it's not a for-profit company, and we hope that we, that you're going to benefit from that. So, for example, we'll be developing reagents and algorithms to increase the uh, plex DIA approach. So we already have a six plex that we hope we will be commercially available later this year. And we hope to develop uh, 20, 50, 100 plex reagents and software that, uh, that can be properly used. 
So how do we go forward? How do we scale this field? We found that when I first started doing, wanted to do single cell protein analysis by mass spectrometry, most people told me that I'm just confused and they're trying to, to beat my head in the wall and this would never happen. The leading um, people in, in mass spectrometry would go around the major conferences and say, so, ah, single cell mass spectrometry is not happening within my lifetime. And there was a lot of resistance, but as data began to accumulate from our lab, from different labs, then it became clear that it's actually not that impossible. We can come up with clever strategies. We can make this analysis work. And we have transitioned from the initial phase of skepticism now to a phase of ebullient enthusiasm when just about any major lab wants to do single cell proteomics. And that's good in a way. Some of that is hype, but I guess hype is intrinsic part of science. As much as I don't like it, I acknowledge it's there. Uh, but what, what we have found is that in this enthusiasm and as many more people join, which is good, I like people joining, uh, we find that, not, that there's need to have good uh, guidelines for how to do this analysis and to, to enforce a set of rigorous benchmarks so that we don't just generate data points, but we generate quantitatively accurate, biologically useful data points. And uh, I was approached by, by editors at Nature Methods who asked me to spearhead and organize a white, community, uh, a white paper for the community with best practices and recommendations. So we did that. And you can access uh, the paper from this website. At this point, it's a preprint, but it received very positive reviews, and they hope that you can read about it. Uh, you can read it from Nature Methods uh, sometime very soon. So if you're interested in doing single cell protein analysis, I hope you can find useful guidelines here. And if you would like to contribute to the discussion, you can also do that from the website. Uh, and I hope you will, as you have uh, experience and thoughts. Uh, that uh, are then going to help the rest of the community adopt those good practices. Um, I'll finish by acknowledging that everything I presented was made possible by a wonderful, enthusiastic group of graduate students. Um, uh, the Plex DA work that I presented was spearheaded by Jason Dirks, and the prioritized scope was spearheaded in the macrophage work by Greg Huffman. And Andrew Leduc developed the sample preparation method that I told you about and did the melanoma work. I'll also acknowledge that none of that, none of what I did would have been possible without the generous support of the NIH Director's Award and an Allen Distinguished Investigator Award from the Allen Frontiers Group. Organizations that like to support high risk, high reward work, which is mostly what they specialize in. I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer questions and engage in further discussions. So thank you very much, Nikolai. So uh, I think you nicely show that it's not really a new thing that we can uh, answer very really wonderful questions in, in, in biology. So it's time for questions. Uh, is there any questions in the audience? Yeah. I have two questions. <clears throat> Can you limit the number of peptides and proteins that you measure so instead of uh, not limiting uh, uh, you can limit to three or four peptides to limit the quantity of data that are analyzed? That's a question. My second question is uh, how about high applications? Is it a human decision? How do you decide? So the two questions are a little bit related. With prioritization, we can determine the exact number of peptides per protein. We can maximize that if we wanted to achieve the highest confidence in protein quantification, or if we wanted to have complete sequence coverage, we can go in that direction. We can also minimize it so that uh, we maximize the number of quantified proteins. So that's very easy. With the prioritization, you can essentially deterministically choose within the detection limit of the system, of course, but you can deterministically choose the exact number of peptides per protein to have in each peptides. Uh, your second question for prioritization, how does this work? Uh, the experimenter can, de can determine which are the proteins and the peptides that you would like to analyze. 
and in fact order them by priority. You can say these 4,000 are the most important ones. They're what they really would like to analyze. And then these next 4,000 I would like to analyze if possible, but it's okay if my data has more holes and it's less complete. And then these set of uh, 10,000 peptides would be good to get just so that they have some depth that I'm okay if I don't see them in every cell. So uh, you have complete control in assigning priority to every single peptide and you can do it at the granular level of individual peptides or you can do it at the level of sets of peptides. And then once you do that, then the algorithm goes about and ensures that your priorities are exactly the priorities by, by which the instrument selects the peptides for analysis. Thanks for, for this nice presentation and for uh, your willingness to share with us uh, all these uh, resources. So I have a, a question regarding the correlation between the mass spectrometry imaging. So uh, do you have any example in which you show that uh, there is correlation between multiple uh, uh, imaging and a single cell uh, to see whether you can recapitulate the same phenotype in Areas, for example. We, we haven't done imaging in my lab. Uh, have other people done that? I know of some efforts, haven't seen those published. I think it's, it's an area in which likely we'll see uh, a lot of work. That's, that's very much along the lines of uh, the thinking of the community right now. We, we saw many people at the conference, uh, the International Mass Spectrometry Conference uh, this week thinking about ways of combining spatial measurements either by imaging, laser capture microwave section, um, with electrospray ionization, single cell measurements. So I think we'll see such work. At this point, I cannot think of, um, uh, of a prominent result where this has been done convincingly. <laughs> yes. I have a question. It's just theory. Uh, working in the field of muscle, yeah. where you have huge cells which contain many nuclei, would it be possible to analyze individual nuclei in that system? We analyze individual nu nu nuclei from small cells, such as macrophages and fibroblasts, epithelial cells. So, yes, it, it's certainly possible. Not tomorrow in the <laughs> Other questions? No. Okay, so thank you again so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Have a nice day. That's right. So our guidelines also include guidelines for data analysis. Um, bioconductor packages that you can use to get started. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, but from the question. Uh,